It's wonderful to be with all of you tonight. Such an honor. Um, I'm really enthusiastic about this time that we have together. Uh, I want you to know that we're going to cover topics that are not exactly the lightest topics in the world to cover. We're going to cover the COVID pandemic, grief, and the topic of health professional burnout. These are topics that are near and dear to my heart for many reasons, but I want you to know that it's normal when you hear about such topics that your mind and your heart may go to places that may be difficult. You may get distracted thinking about loved ones maybe that you are no longer with. And please know that's normal and I will take no offense at all. I want you to really engage in asking questions throughout. We'll save a good 30 minutes at the end of today's talk to, to answer those questions and have a dialogue about them. As you see, the title of the talk today is COVID Grief and Health Professional Burnout, an Opportunity for Awakening. I hope I piqued your interest with the opportunity for awakening part because that's where I'm going to start and it's where I'm going to end. Now, especially when things are virtual rather than in person, it really helps me to get a sense as to who's here in the audience. And so we're going to start with a couple polls. It will really help guide me in that regard, but hopefully help you all feel connected and know who's here together. So let's start with the first poll. And if you could engage in answering the questions, that would be terrific, is just start by letting us know, are you or have you ever been a healthcare professional? Looks like we have just about, oh, well, a couple more people answering. Thank you, we'll just wait a, a few seconds to see. I think we're good at closing the poll right there and uh, Colin will open it up for you all to see. So yes, yeah, so it looks like 21% of you are or have been a healthcare professional and 79% of you have not. So it'll be really interesting when we get to the Q&A to, to find out what questions people have. And I think we'll, we'll know who's been in the profession and who hasn't with that. Let's go ahead to the next question. For the 21% of you, who answered yes, if you could indicate what your profession is or was. So um, I didn't, of course, cover every single category, but if you could indicate if you are a physician, a nurse, a chaplain, a social worker, healthcare professional trainee, which I'm hoping we have some of, or another category. And I realized that first one uh, lists them all, but it's for if you're a physician, if you could answer that first one. Terrific, I think we're ready to, to open that poll for everyone to see. So of the 21% of you who are or have been a healthcare professional, about half of you are a physician, about 25% a nurse and 25% in the other category. And hopefully when we get to the Q&A, you'll be able to um, fill in a bit about the other category. And so now I'm going to move on to why this topic and why this title? The title I include is Awakening. And some of you may, when you hear this, right away think of Dr. Oliver Sacks' 1973 work called Awakenings. And some of you had the good fortune of seeing the movie called Awakenings. It's a brilliantly acted movie. I think it was from 1990, um, starring Robin Williams. Um, and just, just an incredibly acted, powerful film based on real events, although fictional. And, and in this, without giving away the ending of the book or the movie, it's based on uh, what in lay terms we used to call sleeping sickness, uh, an unusual and infectious process that led to people being stuck in these coma-like states for, for decades. And, and in this storyline, a doctor starts to treat people with a medication. For those interested, it was L-DOPA. And people came to life for the first time in decades. Now, if you stop reading right at that point of the book or stop watching the movie right then, that's where the title comes from, is when people come back to life. And both of the topics we'll be talking about today are experiences in my own career where I've gotten to be part 
of the journey of people awakening. On one hand, when people are stuck in a kind of grief we now call prolonged grief disorder and helping them through that and having them re-engage and awaken back to life. And on the other hand, the opportunities I've had of, of leading process sessions for healthcare professionals throughout the COVID pandemic and helping especially physicians, but, but also other healthcare professionals move from a place where they're questioning life, where they're questioning whether they should even be here and helping them move to a point where they're not only no longer questioning that, but actually quite the opposite, fully engaged in life uh, with a full zest for meaning, connection and purpose. So I'm gonna break today's talk into two different parts. Uh, these topics are related in my mind, but are also discrete. And so the first half, we're going to talk about what's known about the pandemic and healthcare professional burnout. Um, but then I'm going to move to talking about what we know about burnout, the focus of burnout interventions in the literature and in practical uh, cases. I'll, as a psychiatrist can't help but remark on the role of psychiatry in all of this, and then spend some time talking about self-care. And in part two, as we'll get to, that's where we're going to focus more on grief, and then I'm hoping to tie them both together. So you can't give a talk on these topics these days without acknowledging the pandemic we're currently going through. That's the COVID pandemic. COVID has been a time of tremendous and in fact profound change, stress, and loss. And in fact, that's an understatement, uh, right, to say this, because the entire fabric by which we live our lives has been altered in the past year and a half to two years. Uh, how we relate to each other, to ourselves, to our communities has changed. There's been tremendous effects on healthcare professionals. Those of you who are in the profession know this full heartedly. But of course, there's been occupational hazards associated with exposure to COVID, especially early in the pandemic, with a lot of unknowns, even about how it spreads and, and the fears that many health professionals had being in the work environments. We all know from media coverage and some intimately about the limited resources, the lack of protective uh, equipment for healthcare professionals to wear in the midst of this pandemic. Some healthcare professionals were working longer shifts because of their colleagues being out sick or with symptoms or leaving the profession altogether, tremendous disruptions in sleep, changes to this notion, and I put this in quotes on purpose, of a work-life balance, and of course, a lack of control over many entities in life, both in work as well as in people's home lives. So there's one study that came out most recently. This came out just in uh, May of, of this year, and it's the largest study looking at the effects of how we all cope with COVID. One segment of this study is looking at respondents across various health occupations. So many of those who are of the 21% here who are in those professions or have been in their lives. Um, and what, what is very evident is that a large proportion of individuals were experiencing this entity called burnout, which we're going to dive into today, just about half. We know that many, and this shouldn't surprise you, you know, many really feared exposure and transmission. A good 38% had significant symptoms of anxiety and depression. Of course, people's work overload uh, became notable for many. And, and interestingly, but not surprisingly to those of us who, who look into these matters, there were gender and race differences. Specifically, females had higher rates of burnout, anxiety, and depression who are in the healthcare professionals compared to their male counterparts. And individuals who are of African-American or Black descent also had higher rates of anxiety, depression, and burnout. It, there's no doubt that in this study that when people felt valued, they had less burnout. So now let's move on to talk more about why should we even care about this entity called burnout? There's a lot of focus on this topic over the past decade and for good reason. And, and so I'm gonna just start with the punchline of why we should care. There are effects of burnout on 
patients, most importantly, on healthcare systems, and of course, on individuals who are, uh, in this case, I'm going to focus on physicians, but the more we know, the more we know this is not limited to physicians. I, I oftentimes joke, and there's always truth to humor, that physicians can be a little bit narcissistic at times, and so they tend to study themselves, but really everyone in the health professions uh, are, are affected by entities such as burnout. Um, in terms of patient care, we know that when patients are receiving care by physicians and likely also nurses who are experiencing burnout, they have lower quality care. They can have medical errors occur, longer recovery times, and, and rightfully, patient satisfaction is lower. Healthcare systems have a tremendous effect as well. People working in the health systems are less productive. There's increased turnover, and it turns out it's very expensive to replace people in the health professions, especially physicians. And, and this leads to all sorts of downstream uh, effects such as less patient access, increased costs for everyone. And then of course, to the individual physician. And that's where I get to have a unique lens with, with the focus of my work. Um, we know that physicians who have increased rates of burnout have also increased rates of depression, suicidal thoughts, tend not to take care of themselves. They tend to have worsened health in the most holistic sense. We also know they tend to be at higher risk for motor vehicle crashes, which is no good for anyone. So I don't expect you to take out a microscope here and try to look at each one, uh, or at least a magnifying glass. Uh, but, but I share this because this right here is, um, you, many of you are probably in Palo Alto and uh, Dr. Schoenfeld, who was really renowned for his work on physician uh, burnout, uh, did the Cardinal survey on this topic that was back in 2011, or at least based on 2011 data. And, and it, these results really shocked the world of how many physicians are burned out. And what this uh, shows here, those, those three different lines you can see, they're very similar colors, so it's hard to ascertain. But if you just go from top to bottom, um, it, it is uh, from 2011 to 2014 and then 2017. And it's broken down by different specialties in medicine. And, and you may get tricked into thinking like you go straight to the bottom where the rates seem to be lower. Um, and you may think, oh, things are great in pediatric subspecialties or urologic surgery. But if you step back and you say, oh, what are these numbers really showing? They're showing that there's alarming rates of burnout across multiple specialties. There's been a ton of interventions. We're gonna cover some of those in the talk today to address this matter. And, and first the rates were rising for, until 2014. And then between 2014 and 2017, where there were a lot of important interventions, although not across the board for each specialty, we started to see some improvement, which was promising. And then boom, the COVID pandemic occurred. And, and we do know that the effects have been layered on healthcare professionals. And many of us will not be surprised that the rates of burnout have not increased since 2017 based on this. Now, the problem is that we're all getting burned out on burnout, especially people in the healthcare professions. It's talked about all the time. People use this term almost flippantly. We're going to get into language and what people mean when they even say they're burned out. But literally, people are being surveyed out on burnout. Um, there, there's some people who are being asked multiple times in a day, are you burned out now? Are you feeling burned out now? And this takes a toll on people who are just trying to move forward and, and remain committed to a mission as to why they went into the line of work that they went into. And I'm gonna do a little thought experiment with all of you to hopefully keep you engaged, even though we're virtual. And, and it's not an exact analogy to the situation with how people are being sometimes, in my opinion, a little obsessive about asking healthcare professionals about burnout. But, but if you roll with me, I, I think that this will make sense is if I told each of you right now, whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant. So whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant. I imagine most of you, if you're still with me right now, are thinking of a pink elephant. And some of you are probably really creative and you said, I, she told me not to think of a pink elephant. It's a, it's a white elephant. That's what it is. But I bet nearly all of you are thinking on some variation of something pink or elephant-like. And you may ask, why am I bringing this up. Our focus 
over the past decade has really been on burnout. It has not been on meaning and purpose in work and life, even though that's the goal of addressing burnout. And, and if you ask someone every day, are you burned out now? Are you burned out now? How about five minutes ago? How about tomorrow? That's on their mind. It's the pink elephant. It's almost all that can be there, at least at an unconscious level. Um, imagine if every day of your life, you're someone in your world that hopefully means something to you said, how, how are you doing with meaning right now? What's been the most joyous moment of this day? Or what has been the most thought provoking moment of your day? What has given you purpose today? And if you were asked this question every day, you'd probably start having a little bit more meaning and purpose in your life. It's debatable, I know. And, and so I'm going to go over the efforts that have been done to address healthcare professional burnout, but I'm going to pose a question to all of you, which is that maybe we have gotten it wrong. So let me tell you what I mean by this. I think this uh, analogy is a very apt one for uh, thinking of, it's really more of a metaphor if we're accurate about it, but, but you've all heard this expression probably of the straw that broke the camel's back. And, um, and I think it's an analogy and a metaphor that really works nicely for the topic of healthcare professional burnout. I purposely chose this image, but just for fun, I encourage all of you later today, Google straws and camels. And it's amazing how many straws a camel can hold. I had no idea until I wanted to find an image and I looked for this one, but I chose this one, which is not as uh, all inspiring from the quantity of straws being carried, but rather because these are little baby camels. And the reality is, is those straws start really early on people. And I think all of you can probably relate when you see how much pressure is put on people from a very young age to succeed, to excel, and, and to uh, try to be something that's impossible, which is perfect. So why do I start with this metaphor? In, in essence, the early work on burnout and healthcare professionals, specifically with physicians, was put on, let's make that camel stronger. Let's teach that camel to meditate. Let's keep, teach that camel to be more mindful. We have to make sure that camel knows to sleep more. We have to instruct that camel to eat healthier. We must encourage that camel to exercise on a regular basis and do specific kinds of exercise. And then we needed to coach the camel to be more resilient. Now, when I use humor to say these things, I don't want you to think I'm trivializing them. Each of these are actually really important processes. But the problem is, is in essence, they ended up putting more straws on the camel's back because it ended up being the equivalent of blaming the victim. But then we, we said, okay, this is not the healthiest approach. Let's put the focus on fixing the camel's habitat. So the focus rightfully also was on that electronic health record. And I know some of you must be in the tech world if, based on where you live. Um, that has caused tremendous stress and all sorts of problems in the healthcare industry. The excessive workloads need to be addressed. The inefficient work processes can be remedied and optimized. And then there are clerical burdens that we could start looking at this notion of having everyone work to the top of their license. And then people got very interested in leadership culture and helping to shift that culture to be a more wellness promoting uh, culture. And, and then there was also looking at the lack of input and control that many healthcare professionals felt in their work. And all those approaches, both helping the camel, right? And fixing the camel's habitat are, are all apt. But the problem is, is that in essence, we did a finger pointing approach. We said, oh, it's the doctor's fault. They just need to do better self-care. Oh, it's the system's fault. They just need to do when you fill in the blank with X, Y, and Z, fix those electronic health records and improve their processes and improve the culture of the leadership. But the problem of both of those approaches is they are finger pointing and no good ever really comes of blaming and finger pointing. More good comes when we can start to see multiple perspectives and we can learn to be self-introspective. And that's what we're going to start to move towards in this talk. So 
many of you have probably seen this, but let's start with the textbook definition of burnout. So it's, uh, Maslow has done the most elegant work on this. Her, her work and her um, scales have been used in most of the research on healthcare professional burnout, but, but that was not the intent. Her, her early work was not actually based on healthcare professionals, quite the contrary, but we've, we've used this and there's flaws and positives that come from that history. But it's a psychological syndrome emerging as prolonged response to chronic stressors on the job. It's, contain, it's a comprised of three components. One of them is overwhelming exhaustion. One of them is feelings of cynicism and detachment. And one of them is a sense of ineffectiveness, a, a lack of accomplishment. And this is most striking when you know those who are experiencing burnout and you know just how accomplished these individuals are. And they, they are convinced that they, they lack any accomplishment. They lack any ability to affect change in the world. I think the textbook definition is very helpful, but when you think of what really resonates, I think this cartoon resonates, and then I'm going to move to different perspectives on burnout that are starting to emerge and walk you through those. But this cartoon, as you can see, you have this doctor who looks just God awful, right? And, and this doctor who looks horrid and this sweet, patient who's sitting on the, um, the examining table, the, the doctor says to the patient, what seems to be the problem, Mrs. Johnson? And she points to this doctor and says, I feel the way you look. And I think this captures it quite nicely. There's newer approaches to understanding burnout, and some of you are probably familiar with these. One of them is this notion of it's not burnout, it's something called moral injury. There's some very evocative and I think a very worthwhile um, for watching videos on YouTube about this notion of moral injury. Uh, the idea behind it is that we all have a moral code uh, by which we, we were raised to believe in, that, that we abide by. And when we're forced to do behaviors that go counter to that code, it causes tremendous psychological difficulty. And, and specifically how this is applied to burnout in healthcare professionals, the notion is that you have um, people who go into this line of work with principles and morality, and the system doesn't allow them to live up to those. And then that causes psychological harm. I can tell you as a psychiatrist, this concept has never sat completely comfortably with me as applied to healthcare professional burnout. And the reason is that the real use of moral injury comes from the kinds of people I treat in my profession. So people who are very traumatized, veterans, for example, and, and this is an evocative um, uh, example I'm going to give you, so just you know, prepare yourself for this, but who they were raised, of course, to believe you would never harm a child, right? And, and they go to war. And their command is that if there's anyone who comes towards you, you have to kill them because they could be carrying a bomb. And so a veteran had to kill a child, right? And, and is haunted by this the rest of their life. They saw that child body die. They saw the mother weep and hold their deceased child. And they're haunted by it. And, and I share this because Moral injury is a very important concept, but we have to be careful how we apply it and ask ourselves, is it fully fitting to this notion of burnout? It, it has a role. So the next one I want to bring your attention to is this notion of that maybe burnout is really a loss of meaning. Um, people lost the connection to the meaning as to why they went into that line of work in the first place. Another concept and what I'm going to focus more on the latter half of today's talk is burnout is a form of unresolved grief. That, that people never had a chance to mourn the fact that the system's not as ideal as they hoped for it to be. And that there's a process by which they can learn to accept that and move on and still engage in meaningful work despite that, but one has to first mourn to do that. This is one I really wanna draw your attention to, which is burnout is code for depression. Mental illness is so stigmatized, unfortunately. I think there's really important progress that's being made in this regard on many levels of society, but clearly so much work is still needed in this regard. Physicians, nurses have started to become much more comfortable using this term burnout. And in fact, I bet all of you have used this term burnout at some point in this year. I've seen the use of it from everything from people being burned out on dating to 
burned out on cooking to burned out on childcare to you, you get the sense of lots of burnout occurring, uh, burned out on COVID. And what I found and many of my colleagues see as well is that physicians in particular will use the term burnout when really what's going on is they're experiencing a major depression. And, and by calling it burnout instead of what it is, there's an opportunity that's missed for an intervention and for appropriate treatment to occur. So I will also beg the question is, have we been a little subtly anti-psychiatry with our focus on the systems side of affecting uh, change around burnout? And psychiatry's expertise is really on the individual. It's helping people hold the mirror to themselves and hopefully asking the question, what role have you played in arranging for where you are in life? And, and this notion of we um, is, is interesting when you blame the system. The reality is, is that physicians and nurses played a role in making these systems what they are. So there's a danger when we blame the system that we're perpetuating this notion of splitting, of black and white, you versus us, uh, and, and no good ever comes of that. So I'm going to now guide us through um, different approaches. I think it's so important that in life we hold the mirror to ourselves. And there are traits that I'll focus on physicians, but these apply to many healthcare professionals. Traits that literally get physicians into medical school, but these traits come with a price. Perfectionism, being detail-oriented, a desire for control, empathy, and even one a lot of people don't talk about, but competitiveness. And, and the reason you want your doctor to have some of these traits, right? You know, you want your doctor to not miss an important lab finding uh, on you. And so you don't want them to be lacking in a detailed focus. You want them to actually have per, some perfectionism to be able to, to not miss very important things. So, now let's move to antidotes to burnout and, and I'll review some of what's in the literature and also some of my own thoughts on this matter. So number one, it's very clear that when people engage in trying to affect change, it makes a difference. And this change doesn't have to be at the broadest international scale. It, it could literally be in, in a subtle local activity, but it could be regional, national and international as well. I think it's so important that, especially physicians, but I, I think this applies once again to all healthcare professionals, work towards becoming what I call a reformed perfectionist. And what I mean by this is someone who has perfectionistic traits, who can learn to dial them up when they're needed, such as not missing their patient's lab finding, but dial them down when they actually trip you up. And, and that's oftentimes in people's personal lives and in their inner personal uh, relations, their, their interactions with colleagues as well. One thought on becoming a reformed perfectionist is I have the opportunity as advisor for wellness at the UCSD School of Medicine to, to be a source of support for various trainees who are, are going through difficult times and having distress. And you can fill in the blank of the many things contributing to their distress. And, and what I very much see with physicians and physicians in training is that when an adversity occurs, when a struggle occurs, especially if it's something that someone feels like they made an error, uh, they didn't live up to their high expectation for themselves, is that it can be something that they feel defines them. And I think it's so important people move beyond that and have their struggles and adversity be things that help refine, not define an individual. There's a lot of focus in the literature and, and in, um, in, in various programs in healthcare systems to put focus on self-care. And, and I wanna stress self-care is not an overrated entity. It's actually a key element. There's an expression you cannot serve from an empty vessel. And that's very true for healthcare professionals. But also very importantly, self-care is a singular focus is a dangerous thing because it leads to people losing touch with the mission as to why they're even doing the line of work that they're doing. And, and that it can be dangerous, it can lead to entitlement, it can lead to um, actually a perpetuation of burnout. So I'll, I'll end this part of the talk by going through other antidotes that I recommend for burnout and, and whether you're in the healthcare professions or not, I know most of you are not, you may be able to apply these concepts to your life. 
It's key that people find a healthy relationship with anger. Anger is just part of being human, whether we like to acknowledge it or not. And so important to pick your battles. You, you can't take on everything in the world. It's nice to practice ordinary kindness and compassion. Think of maybe even today this happened, you're driving and someone cut you off. It's so common for people to get very upset when this kind of thing happens and for understandable reasons. But if you can practice just catching yourself and saying, well, wow, maybe the person who just cut me off is very stressed. Maybe they have an emergency. Maybe they are preoccupied. Maybe their loved one just died and they're distracted. And if you can come at everything in life from a place of compassion, suddenly your life is much easier. The other is that healthcare professionals should very much support one another and also seek out support. This is especially the case when difficult patient outcomes occur. Harm in medicine is not uncommon. There, there's a lot of media coverage of this as well. And it, it's terribly unfortunate for all involved when it occurs. Um, but when the individuals who make a mistake because they are human also happen to really care and also happen to be perfectionistic, there can be problems that occur. There's a lot of focus now on this notion of peer support programs, a lot of great evidence coming out to highlight how helpful it can be when a peer in a healthcare profession is there with some training to, to learn skill sets of compassionate and empathic communication can be there to be a source of support and help normalize um, when things don't go the way we want them to in the healthcare arena. The other is that we need to learn to live with contradictory truths. And that's where I'll get a little philosophical on you, but hopefully you can bear with me in this regard. Life is short and life is long. The COVID pandemic has reminded us so much of the first that life can be so fragile. And if you live your life though, just focused on it being so short, you run the risk of, of practicing hedonism and, and actually lacking meaning because you stop caring. And if you approach life that life is long, you can then connect back to the meaning and finding a truth between these two is where the real meaning making occurs. To best care for others, you first have to care for yourself. It is only through death that we truly appreciate life. Many people have had this experience over the past year and a half is reminders of the fragility and the beauty of life. Um, but, but sometimes we're reminded of this in the most painful of ways. We're all stronger than we know. And simultaneously, we are all more vulnerable than we like to acknowledge. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to shift gears and now move to talking about grief and grief specifically during COVID. The grief I'm going to talk about is going to at the end relate to healthcare professionals, but this is going to reply, uh, apply to all people, not just healthcare professionals. So let's now do a little bit of a polling uh, to, to help all of us know who's here. If you could start by answering, do you know anyone who has gotten very ill from COVID or COVID complications? And, and so far, I'm, I'm seeing the vast majority of you do, but we'll, we'll wait a, a minute to, to see if those numbers start to stop um, changing. It looks pretty consistent. I think, Colin, it's great if you go ahead and share that poll. Um, so over, well over half of you know someone who has gotten very ill from COVID. So let's go ahead to the next poll. And the next poll is, is going to be about, um, do you know anyone who has died from COVID or COVID related complications? I think you can go ahead and close that poll and share it. So over half of you, 54% of you know someone who has died from COVID or COVID related complications. This is a stunning number, but not a shocking one. And so let's now move on to what we're going to do with the, the next 
20, 25 minutes of our time together. I'm going to start by going over COVID and grief and the intersections between the two, psychiatry and grief. And then I'm going to go through different ways to conceptualize grief, focusing on three different types and quote of grief. One's acute, one's integrated, and one's something called prolonged grief disorder. And, and then we're going to bring everything full circle back to burnout and, and hoping to connect those, and those uh, two concepts. So this COVID pandemic has been such a time of loss and, and loss in the literal sense of just amongst us here today, over half of us have, we know someone who has died of COVID. Um, but, but it's been a loss of so much, you know, a loss of people's sense of safety, a loss of, of some people's sense of innocence and uh, wonder in the world. Um, of course, a loss of so many social connections and, and, and the losses go on and on and on for many financial loss. The grief support during COVID is not as optimal for many reasons as we would hope. We know that there have been the, the impossibility of families from being able to visit their loved ones in the hospitals. We know that as a result, there have been limited final goodbyes that, that even, even over an iPad couldn't even be possible. We know that there's been tremendous disruption in funerals. I, I imagine out of all of us here, at least one of us, I know myself, uh, have attended a Zoom funeral, which is better than no funeral, but we know does not entail hugs and uh, comforting solace the way that a non-Zoom funeral can. We know that there's major disruptions in the social support after deaths, um, whatever religion you may be of or not of, there's usually um, approaches after a death of a loved one where, where there's community support, literally in person. And that has not been possible for many people in during this pandemic, disruption of rituals. And, and what we are seeing uh, extracted from the literature is that individual and system level interventions can actually help mitigate against this entity I'm going to describe called prolonged grief disorder. Many people have been looking towards psychiatrists and other mental health care professionals for our expertise in grief. But what some of you may know and which I'll spill the beans on, there's a little fallacy here. Um, but before we get to this, these are colleagues in other departments are coming to psychiatrists and mental health professionals, hospital leaders are, and the public is as well. But the reality is, is that rarely do psychiatry residency training programs focus on grief in psychiatric education? And this is very much the case in medical schools as well for those of you who have attended. This is for many reasons. One is there's an avoidance of an evocative topic. The other is there's a fear of medicalizing a completely natural and adaptive process. And then many people, despite being mental health professionals, feel like they lack expertise on this topic because it was never really focused upon in their training. We, we find even clinically, many mental health professionals avoid acknowledging and addressing grief. It's for similar reasons, it's scary. I mean, they, you can't address grief without diving into existential themes. It's evocative and personal. It, it, many people are afraid that if they start to focus on grief, then they'll get overwhelmed by their own grief experiences that maybe have never been fully processed through. Our culture is distanced from death. Over the past hundred years, this has become progressively more so. Physicians understandably oftentimes feel uncomfortable. So there are themes though of loss and associated grief that are universal in, in the work of, of psychiatry. We focus on the loss of relationships, the loss of employment, loss of identity, loss of mental health. And then of course, there's the one that many of you are thinking of when I say grief, which is the loss of a loved one. Science can only teach us so much about grief. With the topic of grief, I feel you need to approach it from every perspective possible. Literature and poetry are some of our best sources of inspiration and understanding when it comes to grief. And Shakespeare, like so many things, understood this. Give sorrow words the grief that does not speak whispers over the fraught heart and bids it break. 
So let's just go through some background on grief. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share um, some cases. I want to stress to all of you that these are not real cases, rather these are thematic cases based on real experiences. And I'm going to share one person's death and go through how different people grieve and hopefully in that process, highlight different types of grief that people can have. So the death is of an 81 year old man, let's call him Mr. A. And he died of COVID related complications in March of 2020, which is quite early for us in the pandemic in this country, but not early in the world. And so let's start with what is ordinary or typical grief um, and break that down into acute versus integrated. So the first case is of John. John's the son of the man that I just mentioned to you who died of COVID about a year and a half ago. John's 51. He and his father had a very close relationship. When he first learned of his father's death, he was just shocked, shocked by the news and, and, and it literally reacted with, no, no, this didn't happen. He had difficulty sleeping for the first three nights and at times he found himself crying himself to sleep. I was very surprised at his own emotionality because he tended to be a man known for his equanimity and, and it was unsettling for him to have this emotionality. Shortly after learning of his father's death, he did process it with his wife. He reached out to siblings and friends who knew his father well, and they recollected uh, about funny stories and touching stories. And, and he went on to share a sentimental and humor-filled eulogy at his father's Zoom funeral. I, I'll take a, a moment to say, Many people find this that, that they're even if they don't find themselves to be too funny or too touching of a person, that they shock themselves and their loved ones at how humorful and how touching they can be when they give a eulogy. Going back to the case, John returned to work within a week after his father's death, and he really did struggle with concentration at work. He was quite distracted um, for, for about the first two weeks back at work. But he found within a month after his father's death a year and a half ago, he was integrated back into the flow of his normal life. He without a doubt missed his father at times, but he wasn't consumed by the loss. He, he found that his symptoms of grief have returned a couple times throughout the year, specifically the holidays, times where he's stressed and he would normally in his father's lifetime reached out to his father for advice. Um, at the same time, he's just simultaneously filled with gratitude for having his father in his life as long as he did. So what is grief? Grief is the response to loss. If we're diving into the weeds of the jargon, bereavement is the specific term we use for the kind of loss when someone we love dies or someone we're very close to dies. Very importantly, grief after bereavement is permanent. There's no such thing as being cured of grief. Um, Queen Elizabeth once uh, was quoted as saying, you know, grief is a price we pay for love. Dr. Shear, who's, who's world um, renowned for her work on prolonged grief disorder and aspects of grief, she has quoted is saying the following, grief is the form love takes when someone we love dies. And I think this is a much more apt term for what grief is. So what is um, acute grief? So, so when someone we love dies, there's a whole range of emotions, thoughts, behaviors, changes that are even in our physiology, our social life, and for some people spiritually. And invariably, people, when they're acutely grieving, oftentimes first react with disbelief. And that's why it's not uncommon for one of the first things for people to say when they're first learn of someone dying, they say, no, you know, it's a protest. It's, it's, a, it's the shock, it's the disbelief that comes out. There can be very strong feelings of yearning and sorrow. Very importantly, there's a mixture of feelings. So people without a doubt may be crying and feeling sad, but at the same time, they may be able to smile and laugh when they recollect about those touching moments in, in a loved one's lifetime. Um, there are many symptoms, but, but I'll focus on the fact that in the earlier work on grief, people got really set on that it comes in these stages. This was based on Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's elegant work, but very importantly, her work was never meant to be how you grieve. Her work was actually about people who have terminal illness and how they come to terms with that. And what we very much know is that grief doesn't come in these circumscribed stages, but rather it comes in these bursts, these waves. Very commonly, you know, someone's going about their life, they feel fine, and all of a sudden a song comes on the radio. 
or, or they see someone that reminds them of their loved one. And then all of a sudden they just have this wave of grief that overcomes them with respect of emotionality that, that oftentimes accompanies it. Acute grief, this more intense earlier form is usually time limited. And, and over time, what happens is that mourning adaptively, instinctively helps us transition from this acute stage of grief to something we call integrated grief. And, and John's case highlights that he reached a point of integrated grief pretty quickly for him. It was within about two months. That's where that intense emotionality starts to quiet down. That sense of that disbelief that, oh, no, this couldn't have happened really lessens. People engage back in life. Those thoughts, those memories start to recede into the background, become accessible, but bittersweet. And, and so this imagery may help uh, with this concept is that with acute grief, the person who died is consuming the mind, consuming everything, consuming one's life. And that with integrated grief, the person who died finds a beautiful place to peacefully rest in the heart. So just to summarize, bereavement's the uh, loss of a loved one, and um, most people have acute grief earlier on, and that becomes integrated grief in the typical situation. Very importantly, grief is painful. For many, it's the most painful experience of their entire life. It's also normal. It's instinctive, and it does not require treatment. It, it actually can obviously uh, require support from loved ones, even from healthcare professionals, but that's different than treatment. However, there's this one form of grief where that's not the case. This form of grief is when the train gets off its tracks and that ordinary grief becomes derailed. The person does not move on to that integrated grief state. So let me share a case to really highlight this for you. So this is Mrs. A, and this is the wife of the man who died a year and a half ago. She's an 80-year-old, previously very vibrant woman who has felt utterly detached from the world for the past year and a half since the death of her husband, Mr. A. They were married for over 40 years. He was her soulmate, and since his death, she has a profound sense of not knowing what to do and not even wanting to live without him. She's just consumed with longing and yearning for him, and every single day, over the past year and a half, she blames herself for not forcing him to take more COVID precautions, despite us not knowing so much at that time of the pandemic. She literally isolates herself in her bedroom every day. She's wearing his shirt that's unwashed from a year and a half ago, smelling it and crying. She stopped returning loved ones phone calls. She avoids getting rid of his belongings. And even though it's a year and a half after his death, she insists that the spare bedroom he used as the office remains completely untouched. And in fact, if her grandkids come over and, and go into the room, she'll go into a rage. This, this sweetly tempered individual goes into a rage that how dare they even think of touching anything or moving anything. She doesn't go to restaurants um, where they used to go together. They were avid music um, fans and and um and she is very passionate about music and classical music in particular and she hasn't listened to a single classical music piece since he died because she finds it just too painful so what is this complicated or what we now call prolonged grief and you'll you'll hear really different terms traumatic grief complicated grief prolonged grief persistent complex bereavement disorder. So lots of different terms out there, but the newest one people are accepting is prolonged grief disorder. It's when there's a failure to progress from that acute stage of grief to the integrated stage of grief, and it tends to persist endlessly without treatment. Um, people who have this kind of grief, it's like they're frozen in their acute stages of grief. And you, if you have, if you're a professional in this line of work, or if this is, if you're not, and you're thinking of friends or loved ones and asking, do they have it? If they start telling you about their grief and in your mind you're convinced, oh, their loved one must have died just two months ago. And then you find out it was two decades ago. You'll just have this moment where you say, oh, really? You know, and, and that's that's a tip off that there could be prolonged grief. People oftentimes have the following quotes resonate with them. They feel that grief is all they have left and they don't want to leave it because they'd feel that they're left with nothing without the grief. Many people feel like it would be a betrayal to their loved one. If, if they were to not grieve as intensely. And, and that theme of being frozen very much comes out as well. That people feel stuck, time's moving on for other people, but they're not moving on. 
Um, I won't go into the weeds of this slide, but suffice it to stay, say that this um, entity, prolonged grief disorder, is now going to be in the newest version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, the DSM 5.2. Um, and that's the manual we use for research purposes, billing purposes, and clinical diagnoses in mental health professions. So what's known about how do we treat this form of grief? The good news, there's beautiful treatment that's so efficacious. It's called prolonged grief disorder, uh, sorry, prolonged grief psychotherapy. Uh, we, up until just a couple of weeks ago, called it complicated grief psychotherapy. Um, this was developed by Dr. Shear. Um, and, and the results of this study I'm going to highlight to you. I had the great fortune of being one of the main clinical psychiatrists in the study in the San Diego site. And so we treated countless individuals stuck in this form of prolonged grief. People, everyone from people who lost their soulmate, who lost their child, to lost a loved one to suicide, to in some cases even lost a loved one uh, to um, suicide murder. So, um, so really, you know, varied cases, but people frozen. And these are people who are frozen in their grief for decades in some cases, and all of them did beautifully. But those who did especially shockingly beautifully were those who received this kind of therapy. We found medicines didn't really play a role. Where they played a role would be if someone had concurrent major depression and prolonged grief, that the medicines could help with the depression, but don't touch the grief. And so the therapy is what really made a world of difference for people. And so what is this therapy? It's based on a very simple principle that the acute grief will progress instinctively to integration if you can address the complications that, that are getting in the way, uh, that are interfering with the natural mourning process. And that way you can support the natural mourning process. There are certain kinds of death that are worth just taking note of. When someone loses a loved one to suicide, this kind of bereavement is a little different. And, and the reason is that there's so much stigma, that there's shame, People are surrounded by a shroud of silence. Loved ones don't know what to say or how to act. And, and then oftentimes the support is not given to an individual. Um, there, there's a very interesting relationship with anger because when someone dies by suicide, they've been murdered. But the problem is they're also the murderer. So the loved one is, is angry at them, but they're also compassionate for them. And there's conflict that occurs. Many people who lost a loved one to suicide have haunting thoughts, the should have, the could have, the if onlys. I stress this because, you know, just do a thought experiment with me. If you were walking down the street and you saw like a near stranger one day and you didn't look up and smile, and then you found out the day after that that person ended up taking their life and dying by suicide, I bet you would have the thought, oh my gosh, if only I smiled at the stranger maybe they wouldn't have felt so alone. So if you would feel this way towards a stranger, imagine how a loved one feels. It's very, very layered. The more we know about grief, the more we know it's not this category of all or none of, of integrated versus um, prolonged, but rather it's on a spectrum. You know, and where people are, anywhere can be from having it be completely unresolved to resolved, from complicated to integrated. So let's move now um, in our final, I'll probably have five more minutes of the talk and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A and hopefully um, an engaging conversation. So now I want to move along to a healthcare professional's grief. Dr. X is a 50 year old physician who provided care to Mr. A, the man who died a year and a half ago, who we've been focusing on. And, and he's of course the man who died of COVID related complications, but under Dr. X's care. Take a moment to imagine how would Dr. X be doing if in an exhausted state due to her increased clinical workload in the ICU related to COVID shortages, she ordered the wrong medication and Mr. A died shortly after receiving the wrong dose of medication. Or imagine if Mr. A reminded Dr. X of her own father who she hasn't seen in a year due to COVID and, um, and due to her busy work schedule and whom Dr. X worries about dying of COVID. Or let's take it one step further. Imagine Mr. A reminded Dr. X of her own father who died of COVID two weeks ago, two weeks before his death, that she hasn't had a chance to even start to grieve because she's been so busy providing care to people in the hospital. 
So we all as human beings use something called coping defenses. Early in the pandemic, healthcare professionals needed to use defenses to be able to do their job. The three that stand out to me are isolation of affect, denial, and suppression. In terms of isolation of affect, that one is, um, you know, think of a, a, when you think of a professional, and I, I, I jokingly refer to, you know, the four-year-old test. If a four-year-old saw some of the things that someone in a healthcare profession saw, uh, let's say mm, someone throwing up, let's say in front of them, the four-year-old would probably have a reaction that sounded something like this, ew, disgusting, right? But the healthcare professional learns to not have an emotional reaction to such things, to isolate their emotional reaction and to instead say, oh, I'm so sorry to see you're still feeling so sick. Let me help you out with this. So a very different reaction than the four-year-old. People in the healthcare professions used isolation of affect tremendously during the early stages of the pandemic. They used denial and they used suppression. Suppression is setting aside their own emotional needs with the notion they could come back to it, but because they needed to do and pay attention to a task at hand that was more important in that moment. Very importantly though, if healthcare professionals reflexively just use those three defenses, they will end up with burnout. They will end up putting walls up between themselves and their patients. It will be us against them and, and it will lead to an isolated state that ultimately culminates in burnout. There's a time to sit with painful feelings and that with this pandemic, we have found that if healthcare professionals don't take time to do that, they will end up burned out. And, and that's what this slide highlights. However, if you allow healthcare professionals to grieve and you set the stage for that, you can start a whole cascade of very positive things where people don't end up burning out. They're reminded of their own humanity and they're thus connected to humanity and others. And, and so this is where I'm going to come full circle to the title of today's talk, which is that when we really sit with burnout in healthcare professionals and start to think holistically about it and critically about it, there's many opportunities for perspective taking and introspection that we can then apply to mitigating against burnout. When we then connect that to grief and how grief reminds us is an opportunity to reevaluate how we're living and to reevaluate our priorities which those of us, and I stress this part, who were privileged enough to have that experience with COVID, and I stress, stress that for many reasons because many people were not, but, but where even the COVID pandemic reminded people we could do things differently, more optimally, more meaningfully. When we allow those two things to occur, it's an opportunity to awaken our healthcare systems, awaken our own personal lives, and even an opportunity for awakening for society. And hence the, the last image, which I found online, I couldn't help but share. I thought that was a, a, a wonderful uh, photograph and, and really indicative of how this past year and a half can really be something that helps us shift how we operate and, and awaken to, to a more um, compassionate and thoughtful approach to life. So I'll end today's talk with a quote that I use. I rely on heavily and I use this when I teach in medicine, which is a quote that very much applies to grief. And, and many of you may say, well, I don't know if I feel comfortable expressing um, my condolences to someone. My best advice is when you don't know what to do, just be human. And so let's go ahead and end there and open it up to, to questions. Um, I will stop sharing my screen, but if anyone wants me to come back to one of the slides, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, but for now, if I stop uh, sharing my screen, we'll be able to see each other. At least you'll be able to see me. Great. Thank you so much, Alana. That was fantastic. I think audience members, if you feel free, you can use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom to start asking your questions. I do see we already have a few in here, but uh, I think we can just get started then. One question here from an audience member says, if there are over 60% levels of fear of COVID transmission <clears throat> and over 50% cases of burnout among healthcare professionals treating COVID patients, including doctors and RNs, do you have any insight into why such a significant number of those professionals are refusing to get COVID vaccines themselves? 
What an important question. I mean, this, this is one that's weighing on so many people's mind and has, has very much weighed on mine. Um, you know, with this one, it, it's, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that there's an element of denial playing out, right? You know, when something is so scary um, and, and, and existentially driven in terms of what it evokes inside of people, people will do very creative things to help them not feel overwhelmed. And I'm convinced that it's the lack of control that has come with this pandemic and has been highlighted by this pandemic that has made people want control. And, and unfortunately, as we all know, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, one could say interesting, but that's just intellectualizing what's really going on, misinformation, right, about science, about um, public health, and, and it's been perpetuated in certain media groups and certain um, individuals. Uh, and, and, and I found in, in talking with individuals who are in this category, they usually they're, they're fundamentally deep, deep down inside, just freaked out by the lack of control that, that they have in their life in the world and they're trying to regain it. And unfortunately, conspiracy theories and all sorts of things come to life when, when people are dealing with that, but maybe not, um, having a situation where they're consciously aware that that's what's occurring. I can't claim to understand why everyone wouldn't, but um, most people I know in healthcare who have that, I, I am convinced that this is part of what, what plays out. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on, on what it is, if there's an opportunity for a dialogue, I guess it would have to be through the Q&A. No, oh, that's great. I think that's a fair point to make for sure. And it's definitely a top of mind for everyone right now as we try to get through this pandemic together. Um, another question here says, I've had friends and colleagues tell me about the benefits of microdosing psilocybin mushrooms as treatment for depression, anxiety, and burnout, especially during this pandemic. What are your thoughts on the research showing psychedelic therapy as potential groundbreaking treatment for these mental health issues? Oh, wonderful. I wasn't expected to uh, be asked about psilocybin, but it's, it's one of the things that I'm actually really excited about in the field. This may be a game changer, but the, the studies that are occurring right now, this is a pretty hot topic in the field and there's some robust research occurring on the topic of psilocybin for the treatment specifically though, I wanna stress this, of treatment resistant depression. I just wanna take a moment to say that term in itself is an offensive term to many. It just means that, that it's not that the individual's resistant to treatment, it's that our treatments have been resistant to being able to optimally treat someone. Um, but, but I just wanted to, if I use that term, wanna clarify around it. Um, but it just means someone who hasn't responded to more typical treatments specifically two or more. Um, and so studies are undergoing right now using psilocybin, but very importantly, it's not just randomly given psilocybin. It's specifically picked out selected individuals who have profound depression that hasn't responded to treatment and that the integrate psychotherapy with psilocybin. The results that I've heard, I was just at a talk the other day on this from one of the experts in this area are profound. Um, it's not FDA obviously approved yet. I think in the next two years, we're gonna see a big shift in this regard. I understand that there are many people who are doing microdosing. Um, we don't have enough literature to, to guide us in this regard. And I'm really convinced that it's not psilocybin by itself that's, that just uh, you know, leads to profound changes. It's psilocybin in a therapeutic context where there, there's work done first on helping someone think of the themes that are really interfering with where they wanna be in life and taking time to sit with those, then to have the psilocybin experience. And then afterwards, to revisit those themes and to see if there's been a shift. But, but without a doubt, this is one of the most exciting things to um, emerge in the field. And I, I hope everyone is by my side and um, waiting with bated breath to, to see uh, where things go. I would just, once again, caution people from overgeneralizing hearing this and saying, oh, let me go use psilocybin. Mm -hmm. We just don't know enough about it. And I think psilocybin, just like any medication, whether it's LSD uh, or, or drug, I should say, um, or, or even marijuana or whatever it, it is, is that in itself, it's not necessarily going to lead to the change people may hope for, but in the right therapeutic context with the right 
uh, support and what some people go to guides for, um, which I think down the road, people will go to therapists um, for, for therapy assisted psilocybin treatment. Um, I think that's where we're going to start to see some really, really impactful results. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I actually, I watched a, a documentary called Fantastic Fungi. Have you mm-hmm. seen that on Netflix before? I've heard it. I, I will have to watch it now that you mention it. I haven't yeah. seen it before. It's fantastic, as the title says, but it was really opened my eyes. And that was just that they do talk about the psilocybin treatments in a therapy context. And it was really fascinating. And I've I've seen some of the articles as well that are coming out. So, you know, we'll see, like you said, let's hold our breath and see how this comes about. But it could be a a revolution in in the making. So that's just super exciting. I'm glad to talk to you about it, which is awesome. Oh, me too. And, and, and what I will say, it's not just for treatment resistant depression. There's some promising work coming out for trauma and mm-hmm. some very promising work even for addiction. So, yeah. so, so it could be a game changer in many regards, but, but like all things, we need to be cautious um, and not um, you know, jump the gun and make assumptions that we're not quite ready to make. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question here says, what kind of grieving rituals can you recommend in virtual sessions? Oh, what a question. Um, and in virtual sessions, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll interpret that to mean even with loved ones, like just virtual, uh, mm-hmm. even FaceTime or Zoom family meetings or whatnot. I'm assuming that's not just um, from a mental health treatment standpoint. Um, you know, rituals are, are very important for many people. It's, I am not in a position to recommend which ritual one should do because rituals usually come from a deep, background in someone's life, you know, and their, their own culture and their own religion. And, and, and that I would encourage people to think of what rituals pre COVID would one do, and then to think creatively about how you can do it in a virtual fashion. Um, I, I know that's a vague answer, but it would be cavalier and haughty of me to assume that I know which rituals would would work for each and every one of you without knowing you. Um, but I do encourage people that rituals are important though. And, and if there's a way to be creative and continue to do what you would normally do were you not separated through technology or connected through technology, depending on your perspective, um, that, that, that would be a, a high recommendation of mine to, to think creatively with loved ones too about how to continue to, to do whatever ritual is part of your, your cultural and religious background. That's great. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I have another question here. It says, how do you think medical schools can do better at preparing future physicians to tackle both burnout and grief? This is a big one. I mean, I, I have my pie in the sky ideas and then realistic ideas. You know, I, I am really convinced and I need you to know I'm very biased in this regard. I am convinced that each and every medical student should have therapy. And and the reason is that you cannot get into medical school unless you're a perfectionist. But as I mentioned, perfectionism comes with a price. Mm -hmm. And and that it, it, you know, the the medical education should have as a focus the wellness of those that it's training. Um, And and that it, it has a responsibility in that regard to help people be positioned to be able to cope with the kinds of heavy themes that will invariably occur in medicine. Where I see things go not in the healthy direction are when physicians or medical students, uh, even prior to becoming a physician, Mm -hmm. when they make a mistake. They're human. So of course they're gonna make mistakes, right? Um, And and that's where we usually see problems and that I'm convinced that if there can be psychological support, whether you call it therapy proper or whether you have it be um, small groups built into medical education, helping people understand how harm in medicine can occur, how the role of shame, which is never a healthy thing for people to have, it leads people to isolate, not to change behavior, but rather to be literally ashamed and um, be, is very unhealthy psychologically, um, is that if, if we have a focus on how to help people with these entities, how to essentially be what I was talking about earlier, reform perfectionist, yeah. um, how to also, the last thing I'd say is also about compassion. You know, most everyone who goes into medicine is a very compassionate individual. And, um, but, but, you know, as um, Brene Brown's elegant work shows is that 
compassion is not compassion unless it has boundaries to it. And it, many people come to medicine with what they think is compassion, but really what it is, it's, it's a empathy without, um, without bounds. And, and so, you know, I, I will, I'll share an example because I, I think this is an important one, but you, you're probably all familiar with Shel Silverstein's book, The Giving Tree. You know, and I love this story of, of one of my colleagues um, who's, who's very involved in wellness related efforts. She read this book, which was her favorite book growing up. It was my favorite book growing up too. Mm -hmm. uh, she read it to her young, what I will refer to as precocious daughter at the time. And, um, and her daughter, she was expecting her daughter to say, oh, I love it too, mom. Thanks for reading your favorite book. And instead this five-year-old responds with, that was awful. The mm -hmm. mom was shocked. What do you mean? And she said, what's wrong with that, that boy? What's wrong with that tree? That boy kills the tree and the tree doesn't even do anything except be happy about it, you know? And, and it, th this five-year-old's perspective really opens our eyes to wonder, was the giving tree actually a cautionary tale? Did Shel Silverstein never really mean for us to celebrate it and put it on holiday cards and jewelry and all this, the tree was happy. Maybe it's a cautionary tale, that we should think about what it means to give and to give without boundaries can be harmful and you could end up as a, as a stump of a tree if, if you do mm -hmm. that. So, so long-winded way of saying, I think in medical education, we have a responsibility to teach uh, trainees how to not be a stump of a tree, but, but rather how to be a, a flourishing tree with deep roots and, and arching branches. That's interesting. And, and there's actually a question that kind of like follows up to this. So I, I'm going to kind of skip the order here and just go to it. And then we'll jump back to the, the rest of them. But it says, isn't there a reluctance among medical students to seek therapy, especially since an honest answer to the question of whether they've needed therapy would potentially limit their residency options? They, oh, thank you for asking this. Yeah. So this is where, if, but imagine that. Imagine if we build it into medical education. Yeah. Suddenly, yeah, no stigma. Suddenly, no problems with uh, with medical licensing reporting. It was oh, that was just part of my education, right? Yeah. So, um, but but yes, this is this is this is key. Is it and so unfortunate? And there's been a lot of um, stigma actually perpetuated even by some people's efforts in this regard of of addressing physician suicide, which is a very serious matter. Um, and and that is it. People. First, there's time problems with accessing care. There's stigma, things that get in the way. And there's literal um, access to care problems with mental health care delivery across our nation. And medical students are not immune to, to those struggles. And, and so many people are fearful that if they got treatment, that they would have to, they would, that this could be problematic for residency applications. What I can tell you is that tons of medical students these days are in treatment. Um, rightfully so, and doing really well with it. And there's no need any residency ever needs to know about it. That's mm -hmm. not their business. Um, yeah. Where it gets a little more complicated and where a lot of work needs to uh, occur is in medical licensing um, uh, um, rules and regulations across the nation. And each state has different ones and some are horrible. Um, literally, you know, ask questions such as like, have you ever been in treatment for mental illness? which is terrible because I, but I, I think if it's built it into medical education suddenly, right? They thought, oh, mm -hmm. that's part of my education. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question here says, if one of the denied emotions of depression is anger, are the political protests about COVID vaccines really about depression and feelings of lack of control? Ah, ah. So, so, so if I understand right, is that, um, so I would, let me, let me make sure I understand that question. It's a beautiful question. That's why we really want to sit with it. So if one of the denied emotions of depression is anger, are the political protests about COVID vaccines really about depression and feeling to lack of control? I mean, I, I think that the political protests about COVID vaccine are so complex, right? Are so, so are, one could look at so many things if you're, you know, it's not my job to talk about politics here, but it's hard mm -hmm. not to touch upon some themes of what we've all experienced in the past uh, five years and, and, and then some, right? And, um, and, and I, I'm convinced that it, it's really a lack of psychological mindedness and projection. That, that's occurring, um, which is, is, you know, one person doesn't own 
certain feelings and thoughts that they put it on others, right? Mm -hmm. This is actually a helpful way of understanding what racism is, emophobia, all these mm -hmm. things people fear, maybe the, the, the rage inside of themselves, they deny it. And, and instead of having a psychological minded way to come to terms with that, rather they say that person is scary and rageful and dangerous and violent and, and so on. So I, I think that it's more this concept is playing out with the anger. Um, it, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's misguided um, is yeah. in, in, in essence and it's, and it's difficult to address, but I really think that there's so many people who really do feel a lack of control. And they may not be positioned to be in a place where they can acknowledge that about themselves. And so they take it out. Um, but but the rage that we're seeing is this this is something more primitive, um, something something deeper than 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 anger. And and, and in terms of um, the the original question, you know, is anger is a denied um, affect with with depression. And one of the oldies but goody theories about depression is that depression is anger turned inward. Mm. So, um, and, and one could think about it, that we're not seeing anger turn inward when you get to groups of individuals who are raging together, right? That this is yeah. anger turned um, not inward, the yeah. opposite, but yeah. put on someone else and towards yeah. someone else. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question here says, there's still stigma associated with seeking help to process grief, especially if it is coupled with depression. How can that be overcome among healthcare professionals and non-healthcare professionals? Yeah, so, so, you know, I think the more we can just get comfortable talking about it and thinking about it and, and not, um, not, not tucking it away, because it really, what I find with healthcare professionals, it's not stigma around grief. Um, and care. There, there's stigma about getting mental health care that there's stigma about um, but but I don't necessarily see stigma about grief what I see is denial of people's humanity I, I see that the doctors you know are, are so used to putting other people first so are nurses um, and and they're used to depriving themselves of some basic needs right and um, and and it's a very overwhelming for many physicians to acknowledge that they're human that loss hits them hard. There's an expression that, that grief always waits, meaning that if you don't process your grief, it, it's very patient, it's more yeah. patient than you are. And, yeah. and it, it, it will always be there uh, for, to, to get you, if you will. And, um, and so physicians uh, and healthcare professionals are really at risk for that because they may be so used to tucking it away and, and it will come out in their professional lives, in their personal lives. And so I think the more we can teach uh, about it, the more we can normalize, um, and the more we can make healthcare, mental health care in this case, more accessible, uh, I think the more we, we can do, systems can do a lot in this regard too. So, so smaller examples, you know, our SAVE uh, program at, at the residency where, where I'm involved in training. And, and there is, is, you know, this notion that, um, it's profound for a mental health professional to lose a patient to suicide, for a patient to die by suicide. The effects can be very unsettling, um, can literally take the floor from underneath one's foot, figuratively speaking. And, and so we know it's, it's just critical that we model for people the importance of receiving support around those events. And I think the more healthcare systems can model this for people, the more we normalize and the more we help. Um, Sam, you, you asked also, or whoever posed the question about non-healthcare professionals, and I would say the same, the same themes apply, um, yeah. just for, for us to start to move from a culture to one where we start to, to just become more open to just accepting loss, acknowledging it, and not being so fearful of it, that, that we avoid it. Makes sense. Definitely a good, good answer and a good question there. Um, another question here says, my son is active military and in need of psychotherapy. He is hesitant because of the higher ups find out he is in counseling and may affect his chances of promotion. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, talk about a culture that needs some shifting around. It's yeah. the culture your son's in. Um, you know, I would still recommend he gets support. If he needs help, help is a priority. Yeah. Um, I would encourage him to start by talking with the chaplains. 
and to talk this through. This is a place where it's not stigmatized in the military to make use of the chaplain service. Um, and, and I would um, have your son broach this topic with the chaplains and have them help guide him in this regard. But, but I'm a big believer in that, that I'm not in denial of the reality, which is that there are many cultures where mental health treatment is very stigmatized, so much so that there can be a concern for um, retaliation or, or just consequences, one should say, for getting care. Um, that's not a reason one shouldn't get help when help is needed. Absolutely, it's a great answer. A um, Couple of last questions here. It says, one says, are psychiatrists particularly vulnerable to burnout? Why or why not? Yeah, you know, it, it depends on the kind of work the psychiatrist does. I, I think that psychiatrists are it, it, um, high risk. I mean, the studies show that, that about half of psychiatrists are burned out. And, and for many psychiatrists is that they went into this mm -hmm. line of work because they love the art of medicine. They love mm -hmm. listening to people's stories. They love connecting and they loved helping people through their pain. Um, and that the systems in which many psychiatrists work uh, and the ones where they pay psychiatrists a lot more money to work in don't allow for that meaning making aspect of the work. It turns more into a factory line, right? Of, of uh, medication prescription after medication prescription, which is not the same thing. So I, I find that psychiatrists who are working in some of those settings are at particularly high risk for, for burnout. Awesome. Um, and we'll finish up with this question. I think it's really interesting. Um, it says, do you have any advice for family members who are caregivers for older parents or chronically ill family members, especially if you are taking care of someone suffering from cognitive disorders or rare developmental diseases for which ready cures aren't available? Oh, what a, what a very, very important um, last question. And, and, you know, and, and I'll start by, by relating this to grief um, and, and burnout, because this is both, is it, when someone is a caregiver to a loved one who's aged, especially who has, possibly I'm guessing in this case, a dementia or a rare um, neuro, um, uh, it sounds like maybe a neurologic uh, condition that could be otherwise, um, there's a kind of grief called anticipatory grief. And this is a grief where you're anticipating the death of a loved one. And so the grief process can start already. It is key that people who are caregivers get support themselves. A caregiver cannot do their job 24 seven without relief. And so my best advice for caregivers are to get involved in a support group for fellow caregivers. It doesn't have to be perfectly matched. If your, your loved one has, let's say a rare uh, condition, you don't need to find people providing care to someone with the exact same condition if it's not available. But, but very much a support group can be tremendously helpful. So can respite services. So that the, the individual who is the caregiver has time to breathe, has time to attend to life um, outside of the caregiving role. Uh, I find that reading uh, it can be useful if that's something you enjoy, and and there's um, you know you can look into some options of those who have been caregivers um, writing about the experience. I find using humor can be useful, but but obviously not in a defensive way. But but it, especially that's what the can come out of support groups is helping to find some humor in not so funny situations as well. But a hundred percent getting treatment for oneself and when I say treatment it doesn't have to be formalized but support um, because yeah. there, there's a huge burden to being a caregiver but there's also tremendous meaning in being able to be a caregiver um, and and so it's important to to feel supported in in that process awesome well thank you so much Alana this has been a fantastic session I think everyone who tuned in tonight definitely took something away from this super interesting, super relevant for right now. Um, and I think all of these questions we had were super, uh, they're great. I mean, this really provoked a great conversation at the end and they brought up relevant topics that a lot of people are thinking about. So thank you again for, you know, taking the time to speak with us tonight. Uh, once again, audience members, this was our last Cafe Sigh of the year. So thank you for joining us this evening, but be on the lookout for our communications uh, for what's to come in 2022. And with that, have a great rest of your Thursday evening, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, next year.